Hello, this is Haka the Bean, and today we are going to be reading some r slash D&D horror stories. You know, stories about D&D where either players or game masters are really bad. If you like this video, please like on the video, comment down below, and subscribe to the channel. Now let's get right into this. The Headache Farm. I can tell you what's going to be my biggest headache with this story. It goes on forever. But that's fine. Hello there. I know that my tale I told here has probably already ended up with it from this player's perspective, but I want to share my experience DMing for a group DMing for a group made of friends. I have three stories total, two of them as the player and one with me as the DM. I am going to lay down the character's name as we go through each headache as I had eight players in this game. Eight is way too many. I'll be keeping some of the details vague for the sake of brevity. To give you the short of it leading up to the first headache, the players are each given tickets, which are teleportation scrolls to this shadow organization's headquarters. They exist in a realm between realms to prevent the interference of the gods in their dealings. This leads them to use a, mag a mage farm where they channel their energies through a spire to keep their little island afloat. They meet each other in this waiting room where there are some antics involving a magical light fixture. They are given in quests by men obsessed with rugs who also runs the place. They need to kill this this orc warlord terrorizing some towns. Easy, to the point, characters didn't question why, they're on their way. Fight some, some goblins, rest in town for session 0 to end, we're off. Session 0, that was in session 1. Do you not know what the session 0 is? Session 0 is... The point in time where you tell people the, the basic premise of the game and you make boundaries. And usually it doesn't last that long and after a while you either just hang out or you go away. So you can have some time to prepare for session one. Unless you're like way prepared for everything ahead of time. <sighs> well, let's move on, I guess. So Spencer is a rabbit bard who carries a skull of his mentor around, a knight named Francois. Or Francis. Francois sounds cooler. I was trying to decide on the arc to give each character, and for Se Spencer, I was seeking to let him complete his journey in becoming a knight. He'd need to accomplish a great feat to beat his mentor. Well, that was a little bit irritating. Anyway. But how? Well, there is this evil god of fate that curses anyone for affiliating with these guys in the spire. To be clear, the guys in this fire are not good guys, so each PC got discrimination into the future involving their worst fears. But that is getting off topic. No kidding. To solve my dilemma of helping Spencer become a true knight, I have this evil god of fate. We'll call it Elgres. Revive the dead body of Francois. The heavily armored corpse now haunts the party, seeking to reunite with its head. So I had this whole story planned out until one fateful day at a goblin slave camp. There's slavery in your game. Whatever. <sighs> you see, the orcs were using the goblins to create mass amounts of, of weapons for the orc war machine. This is... terrifying. I was told by the party to include combat with objectives other than fighting, so I did. 
there's a, a lever up on the hill to release the goblins from a cage that most of them are in. Spencer's character decides to beeline it, it for the, a lever without taking any precautions. And I pull the DMs. Are you sure you want to do this? So despite some protests from the party, Spencer reaffirms his decision to beeline it for the lever. Whenever Erdem pulls the, are you sure you want to do this? Double check what you're doing. I tell the party to roll initiative as they are ambushed from the trees by Orgish archers. This could have been avoided if the PCs had decided to explore the area first or alternative methods of getting the goblins out. I made that especially obvious. There were three different side areas. Okay. Was it obvious to a three-year-old? Because, let's be real, if your puzzle isn't obvious to a three-year-old, it's going to be hard for a d, d e party. I don't know why, it just seems like the case. I even tried to leave ominous warnings like arrows on the trail up to the lever. A dead corpse of a goblin having been pincushioned. Despite all of this, after the fight, Spencer tells Clancy, one of my lifelong friends who was playing an air elemental cleric that was really over tuned, that the fight left felt really unfair, and that he was targeted. Okay, so, here's the thing, you have eight players. Isn't that the entire Phantom Thieves team in the, the baseline in Persona 5 game? I don't know, I feel like you had more enough of people to make it feel oh, like a fair fight. I had never targeted this player before, and the only reason why he was targeted in this instance is because he was in the process of releasing the entire orc slaver force at the camp, the consequence of his reckless actions. The party won the fight, but to this day, some of my friends from that group still think I had it out for this guy's character. For the rest of the game that he participated, I was essentially not allowed to target him out of for fear of being told that I am a hateful DM. Well, that's a little bit odd, and also that was a bad decision from the player. He left after the third session because Clancy kept telling him what to do, and Clancy's frustration had scared him off the game entirely. I'll save that headache for last. Seems like, like all of your friends are being considered headaches to you. That is a little concerning. I'm saying that I think that at, at there are two sides to the story, and I'm not, and I'm. Only hearing the DM side. To give you the details for the rest of the story for Act 1, the party deals with some diplomacy with the Orc Warlord, trying to get to the bottom of why he is raiding the villages. It turns out the Orc Warlord was getting paid for it by the King of the Region, so to keep the local lords in line and depend on his protection. In turn, the Warlord was securing a place for his people away from the um, populace that primarily Humans which hated them. Oh dear. That was a little bit concerning. The party doesn't do much with this information and still kills him anyway whenever he is beating with a dread at in the forest. As they do this, they get another premonition a few nights it's later of the future in Act 2, where they see the leftover orcs, now outcasts, fight amongst themselves, and instead of lightning damaging the towns, are right destroying them. This is where the actions of the people in the spire are supposed to start sinking. 
Now the group is already in with them though, and they decide to take up a second job. That is to 1. Protect this king of the isles, and 2. Destroy the source of Rykreen and Fr Extra on the island to ensure that his safety. Rykreen. Never heard of it. <sighs> Let me briefly introduce Headaches 2 and 3. I'll keep this one short. Joseph invites a friend, Wild Elder, to, uh, to join our game. Joseph is a troublemaker and naive person, but usually well-meaning. So, they're new to D&D. &D. I remember being quite the troublemaker and pretty naive when I first started D&D, &D, or rather, Pathfinder. Yeah, it was my first time playing any TTE RPG, so oh, we all kind of could just call it D&D. &D. He plays as a bug rogue. Okay. Wilder, Joseph's temporary friend, genuinely an annoying individual, he played a bug wizard. The only problem I had with Joseph is him asking for things from other modules, which would make me bounce into the encounters even harder, as one of my headaches were already making this a hard ordeal. All I would do is switch up stats around to fit the module we were working with and still let them have the item. He was insistent on the stats, which I would shut him down. Wilder, on the other hand, did not seem to be taking the game seriously and would try everything in his power to break the game. I would usually just be honest and say, I don't expect you to interact with this, and I don't have a map for the area. It's genuinely just a side detail for you to enjoy looking at the map I made. This wasn't enough for the, his player, and they'd often be rude by interrupting other players repeatedly after being asked to stop. The total amount of their behavior culminated in me just banning them from the game. They actively hampered other players' abil other's ability to enjoy it, and I wasn't going to play a ball that way. As most DMs, I'm sure you should always try to make sure every player gets to have fun. And if one player is making the rest of the party not have fun, then it is completely okay for that player to be booted from the game. Oops. To give you a brief synopsis of what happens in Act 2, the gang end ends up helping the king retrieve a MacGuffin I will liken to the cube from Rimworld. A cube that has you obsess over it until you assign everything else to be with it. The characters could feel power emanating from this chart of light that they picked up, and this caused a lot of infighting. Instead of giving it back to the king, Joseph, our bug rogue, joins it and joins the Icreen infestation. The what? Oh, right, the thing you mentioned earlier. I still don't know what Thrycreen is, and I don't want to look it up. I'm scared. The party learns that they are being controlled by some force of Elgris, the evil god of fate from earlier, and they are trying to destabilize the Isles for some reason. Did I mention one of the characters tried to hide a discharge of magical energy somewhere not entirely polite to say here? Yeah, the players were not comfy with that. Leading up to it was the fun part though, as each of them had their own turns in this stealth combat at Havabalu. That is a fun word. Havabalu. <laughs> okay. After throwing himself over, we hatch a plan for what he can do. It was less hard to hatch this plan than it was to help him create a new character because of his sense to borrow things from other modules which did not fit in the current balance of the one I was running. The, far <sighs> the party fights him, wins, and descends into Act 3. Act 3 is a desolate, magical wasteland where our, dis where our story has wrapped up, as I decided. 
I had enough by this point, and the party was running out of steam too. Their only objective was to make it back to the spire to collect on their rewards and live off of the money they'd be paid. They find this old dwarven fortress and looked into the Mirror of Fates, which acted as our end and credit scene. During some, I made a you play checkers in D&D, and other fun shenanigans involving the magical mutants, I knew you had something serviceable. Headache number four, Yvette. She was a sweet it's girl but had a really big temper. She played a human paladin. Whenever something was impossible to be solved by her, she'd complain about it, get angry, and then leave the table. Which would often dampen the mood of the entire table. I will give just one example since this happened many times. Yvette sees three statues. A player casts the detect magic on them. They are obviously magical. They crackle with energy whenever Yvette's player gets close. Instead of exploring why this is, she decides to charge face first into a statue, hits it, and ends up dying to the blast over multiple turns of trying to break it down with a polearm. <clears throat> After that, a player steps towards a fighter, and the traps don't seem to light up. Another player, a sorcerer, dies, and they seem to light up in response again. Yvette causes bowl and favoritism. Fighter explores why these statues don't do this. However, a sorcerer gets the idea to use fire as a sort of shield, and it seems to work. Some of the other players step forward, and the party's artificer named him Lee, and they don't lay up for him either. But now the party is catching on. Oh, they react to magic. The damage from the paladin, however, had been done to the group's mood at that at point. Well, dogs are going crazy. Anyway, Hick number five had been a prompt player the entire game. However, Clancy was one of my best friends for almost my entire life until after this game because I realized I couldn't play games with him anymore. I can get not playing TTRPG is with them and because you can't handle it, but I don't see why that has to end your entire friendship unless it's something really, really bad. Well, I guess we'll see, though. I mentioned him earlier. Er, he plays an L. <laughs> he plays an air elemental cleric. The main thing I have to worry about is that he had turned his cleric to always upcast Shatter, which ended up dropping dead a majority of my enemies for the group. Combine this with some natural abilities that Reyes is giving them, and you had a player who should spend more of his time healing other characters instead of being the DPS, and he, as he'd run out and complain that he couldn't do anything after one on combat. I ended up having to introduce characters who were either resistant to a shatter so other players could have fun or utilize more singular boss-like characters for the party to fight as a whole. After he left the combat, I had reported become more enjoyable for the group because I no longer had to overtune the enemies to deal with the over or tuned storm cleric. Though I had told the group this was a more roleplay heavy campaign, so every time we had a narrative moment and the group didn't want to Go the way he was pulling, and he would be like, Guys, I am the only one making charisma rolls, which wasn't his specialty. I did this intentionally because I encouraged the whole group to work as a team on things. Clancy, however, always felt like he should be the one to do everything, which caused him a lot of stress. He had told us that his therapist blamed D&D &D for a lot of his stress, which, after speaking with him about it, I urged him to quit, and if he needs to. Before he quit, I took these long, arduous weeks 
of him going through cycles of being really upset over something or him being really happy at something going on in the game. I had told him that, that if he just stepped down from trying to do everything himself, it would be fine. But I am not sure what was going on mentally, and I generally feel bad for him. But the group of people I was with shouldn't have been subject to his fits of anger and moodiness whenever things didn't go his way. Yeah, okay. I'm starting to see where, you, where you're coming from um, um, a lot more. So Walker is a tiefling sorcerer. Generally a nice guy and would do things according to his background, which include him getting inspiration points for sometimes inconveniencing the party or accidentally causing damage to random members of the party. This was to reflect the corruption his character was going through as he had a curse placed upon him. These strange glowing tattoos were slowly taking over his face, and instead of role-playing with him and talking about it, none of the group ever acted like they cared for his character. So he role-played it out of his character. So he role-played it out, out his character's isolation slowly as the party seemed to ostracize him. He wasn't a problem player, just to clarify, and was never mean to anyone in the group, and often used his chances to help other characters where he could. One day, however, Walker hits Clancy in an encounter with a fireball, as he got caught in the AoE. He doesn't do much damage with the roll. After the game, Clancy freaks out. In a private phone call, in a private call, he tells me everything that has gone wrong in the past, which I had responded to and did things to fix and place a lot of the blame of what is going wrong with the party on Miggy. At this point in the game, it was really only Clancy having these issues and he was projecting his feelings onto the party as a whole. I even went back and asked individual members of the group how they were feeling just to double check. I admit I haven't been the best SDM because this was one of my first games. One of your first games and it was an 8 player game? But I had pretty consistent good games and responded to criticisms by changing aspects of the games that the group didn't like. Anyway, after telling Clancy to please stay calm and that I would do something to help out with the situation, Clancy relents. I call up Walker and ask him, hey man. Let's change some things. And he does, for the better of the group. Turns out later, Clancy had called your vet after our next session and told her that he told me to completely kick Walker out of the game. Walker, who had probably been the best influence on the group, was being ousted because Clancy had been innocently caught in an AoE spell. From my point of view, at this point, Clancy had just left the group without announcing why, because he had never mentioned to me that he wanted this done. Clancy, you see, had been my friend for most of my life. But I also had some pretty strong principles. I wasn't going to kick Walker from the game because of a mistake. And I wouldn't have kicked Clancy from the game for any of his mistakes like that. Yes, I talked to them about those mistakes, and I wouldn't go to ooh, the lengths that Clancy was insisting that I go. Clancy takes this as me choosing Walker over him despite our long friendship. All in all, that encounter with Clancy made me realize that in all of the other games we had played, he would continually grow more and more frustrated as those games went on, and his behavior had been worse worsening for years. So, I removed myself from him, and suddenly found that my gaming life had become steadily more happy and joyful as a result. 
So, I hope you enjoyed my ramblings. It was nice to get the, this all off my chest. You had been sitting on me for a while. Please tell me there are other comments. This is like... I made a meme about how this being a little bit long at the beginning, but honestly, it was worth the read. And I will admit that I can see that, yeah, the DM made some mistakes, but some of the players were being in bad at players. Okay, anyway, let's go to the next story. <sighs> One story took 26 minutes. That's beautiful. It's okay. The other stories... Well, these next two are far shorter. Me and my sister's first encounter with that guy. My family went to a D&D session at a game store. It happened a while ago, so I don't really remember any details. Me and my sister were playing characters that, were planned, that we planned to reuse for a curriculum of chaos, for a curriculum of chaos game. Our dad also joined us with a pre-made character the store had. There were two other people with us, another girl and that guy. That guy made an arc okra sorcerer with a staff of fireballs. We were allowed three magical items of differing strength. Okay, one, don't give your players magical items too quickly. Two, if you're a DM, and you will get an arc okra sorcerer. Or like any sort of um, bird like creature. You better be prepared for a flight. Because they're going to be using that. And they're going to be using that to basically try and um, screw you over. Three, staff of fireballs. That means that they can uh, and shoot a set number of fireballs. I mean, the staff only has so many e e charges, so they can shoot a fireball a set number of times before it becomes a useless stick. I don't remember what campaign it was, but we wanted to get some magic swords that were inside of an volcano. And at the entrance, there was a sphinx who told us to solve a riddle or it would eat us. I was game to solve this riddle, but that guy cast fireball immediately. And we went into combat. We won, but found out there were three paths, all leading to different swords. And the Sphinx was supposed to tell us which path led to each sword. Yeah, I don't know who the DM um, is here, but I know that I would probably be like... Dude, no. You don't cast fireball because you're, you're trying to solve a riddle. We went down a random path and we chose the water one. Hooray! So that guy's spell almost didn't work in the first encounter, which was a pit of water with water spirits inside. That guy just flew over, leaving the rest of us to figure it out. DM should have sprained his wing or something. I don't know. My memory gets a little fuzzier here because I was starting to be just annoyed and tap out. We enter another room and find a large room with a treasure with a treasure chest in the middle. The room was made of glass and surrounded by water. I don't remember what comes next, but I do know we end up finding a giant. Uh, probably due to that guy's recklessness. During combat, he used his fireball even after the DM told him it would cause the glass to shatter or, and that it would cause the boiling water to flood the room. Boiling water. Oh dear. Boiling water floods the room, 
and I think we all made ate it out safe. I'm pretty sure there was another incident with a tunnel of fire where we tried to leave him behind, but I'm not sure. Well... Yeah, our first comment is right. I would pick on, up on this quickly and probably either quickly off his character or just kick him out of the game. And honestly, it's fair to do the second one. Just simply say, okay, that's enough. Get out. The empty table. Finally got the courage together to get a D&D &D group together at my local M store. Finally get players, grab a table in store, and have a first session. Then... No one shows for a session two. Okay, no problem. Get some new players and start over. Great session. Excellent. Then another, even better session. No one shows for session three. Yeah. Scheduling conflicts do suck, but they happen all the time. Especially in D&D. It's always hard to figure out a schedule, especially with when you're like above the age of going to school. Yeah, that's a really specific age. If you who are if you who are trying to schedule D and D session D and D sessions with like people who have families, jobs, maybe even college and stuff, it can get really, really hard hard to do that. Anyway, um, I think this last one is really funny. Oh, oops, spoilers. DM turns into Baba Yaga. Anyway, I think Baba Yaga is a, um, Fairy tale. Uh, I think it was something about an old lady who lives on a mountain, and she just comes down to town to get as much um, alcohol as she can, and, and leaves again. I'm not really sure. I forgot. All right, let's continue. Freshman year of college, I I joined. A D and D club because I thought it'd be a good way to make friends. Oh no, not school D and D club. School D and D always sucks because you can't kick anyone out or tell anyone not to do it, not to do stuff or anything like that. I played one session of first edition D and D and ran a campaign in another system at this point, but I wasn't experienced in D and D at all. No, but you are very experienced in tabletop RPGs. What followed was a very unenjoyable campaign that I kind of just went along with, assuming I was just playing wrong due to my lack of experience. There were like 20 people there. Already, that's already awful. That's already the worst thing you can do is like have a have a D&D club and then have everyone play in one D&D game that is not how any sort of D&D club should work because you need the multiple games for a reason and the first meeting involved everyone deciding on a world we wanted to play in we sort of came up with it, it on the spot with everyone throwing ideas uh, as out that we thought were cool the world we developed was mainly themed around floating islands where everyone was well off, while on the surface below, disease and poverty spread. That is terrifying and probably a very common an idea. The main DM, henceforth referred to as Patrick, sort of just came up with everything else world building related from, related from there. <laughs> Patrick. I've been watching a lot of Spongebob lately. I love that name. I'm not really sure what the uh, what the process of this was. 
I'm not sure if he just came up with everything on the spot or had other stuff he based it on. I mean, floating islands with disease and poverty, where the islands are like really um, high class and disease and poverty is really like, or like I mean, the surface is like really low class. Isn't all that at new? And I think that I've seen a lot of stuff like that. Usually the floating island, I think that Final Fantasy IV, 7 did that, but the floating island was artificial and used energy that was going to kill the planet or whatever, you know? I mean, sure, the service wasn't disease and poverty, but it was still up on the higher levels you had the more well-off folks and on the lower levels you had people who were willing to fight against the system and who were not as well off all right let's continue since there were so many of us uh, as we split into three tables oh thank goodness the three parties were all in the same world at the same time but in different locations i think there were plans for the parties to meet up at some point i don't remember Patrick DM for another, for another table but would switch around and make things happen at our, at our table sometimes. It was a, a really unconventional way of playing, and again, I'm not really sure what he was thinking. Anyways, I was playing a Dragonborn Artificer. His main thing was that he wanted to be a cult leader, or at least control others. He was selfish, sneaky, and duplicitous. Quite sure it, it's it's a word that I, I, I can and relate to the other two, but I'm not sure exactly what it means. I'll have to look it up later. I sort of had a vision of what I wanted to do with them, but due to my lack of experience, I didn't really know what those those things happened. And from having conversations with the DM about, about it. Later in the experience, it saw me talking about DM, my vision for my character, and then um, incorporating what I want into the campaign, while still having it be unexpected. At the time, I just thought I was supposed to play really well to get my character where I wanted. I don't know. The campaign started, and we just kind of screwed around on the surface and went to rob a temple or something. Then the Patrick dusted out. Busted out the deck of many things and just had people start pulling from it. Like, a lot. No. That is the one thing you don't. The deck of many things is not something you should be putting into a DD game if you aren't ready for it. That deck is like terrifying. Like, you can literally retcon your character to have never existed with the deck, with that deck. It can insta-kill your character or, 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 or just because you pulled the death card. Like, we just kept pulling from it and random and stuff started happening. All I remember is that at, at such an end with a Mayan and Sun God cursing everyone. It didn't really make any sense. Patrick also casually dropped that every god from every real life pantheon also existed in this world and they all kept freaking with at us randomly. We moved to another table with another DM. I will call him Daniel. At some point we went to a city on one of the floating islands, and a couple of us weren't allowed in because we were non human races. Oh, Racism in D&D. Well, I mean, they could be done well. We disguised ourselves, went in, and made an escape from the guards, and when we were about to be found un out, out, it was actually pretty fun. But then Patrick came over. He corrected Daniel, telling him that the wizards in the city were much higher level than and Daniel thought. Not sure or how this was a term, considering and we all came up with the world day one of the club. I guess Patrick just decided that. 
He sees control from Daniel. Oh, gosh. Patrick is going to be a little bit annoying, isn't he? And then everything we just said and DM'd himself. I believe this time I wasn't allowed in the city at all because the wizards were high enough level to detect our disguises. So I and the other non-humans just waited outside at the walls while everything went on inside. I tried to interfere by grinding over into the city, but Patrick didn't really pay attention to anything I was trying to do and seemed oblivious to the fact I was excluded. The entire city blew up for some reason and I just watched him from outside. We got magic items at some point. My freaking and goodness. One member of the party randomly got this. Well, let's look at this again really quickly. Wondrous items, Baba Yaga's mortar and pestle. Okay, so this is a Baba Yaga item. We can't read this all. But it looks pretty e powerful. A little bit overpowered, if you ask me. But I'm not sure how far they are in the campaign. I will henceforth re refer to this player as Ty. Ty realized that the mortar and pestle has properties which allow it to change it in size and control telepathically by the user. I don't believe this is the item's intended usage, but I use it for everything. He used it as a weapon just by flying it into people. Well, I did hear it was, well, according to the description, it was supposed to be able to be turned into a quarterstaff, but I don't think that's how you're supposed to use it. He traveled around in it. He picked people all up with it and just threw them. There was a problem that could not be circumvented by that freaking mortal and pestle. This one item actually nullified the skill of the rest of the party by how useful it was. And Patrick just let him. It was around this point that I started checking out on, from the campaign because no action I took had any effect. Then, then Patrick had Baba Yaga show up, every god ever or exists in this, in this world, to retrieve her moral and pestle from Ty. Ty killed her. And Patrick turned Ty's character into the god Baba Yaga. What? Just killed her? Not Ty got killed by her? Really? He had a 25 in every stat. Okay, no. First of all, that means that the original Baba Yaga was supposed to have a 25 in every stat, which I don't buy for a second because your stats in D&D max out at 20. He got access to Baba Yaga's house, which had weird sci-fi elements to it and he could control it and stuff. Since my character is sneaky and clever, I thought, oh, it would be cool if I hijacked the scenario because that would be in character for me and create conflict. I asked Patrick if I could steal the password used to access the house, but Patrick just said it was in a language my character couldn't read and didn't give any other options while he moved on trying to tie all the cool stuff he could do. The campaign from this point forward consists of everyone following a tie around while he killed stuff. There was a An entire session where Ty had to kill avatars of the seven deadly sins. And since every other character in the party was still level two or whatever, we just followed him while he one shot them all. I stopped playing shortly after that. 
That's what I... God damn, that's just annoying. I was actually convinced for a while that the reason I was so infected to the story was because I felt my character run, and not because the DM was an inconsiderate e egomaniac. He just sort of did what he thought was cool without considering what was fun to new players. When he was the president of the D&D club at his university. And all with a sense of smugness around the fact that his DMing was so harsh and unforgiving. You don't get to claim your DM is so harsh and, and unforgiving when you give your or, or players an overpowered item and then allow them to kill a god and then basically become the next and, and basically become the new god. It was really obvious he got some satisfaction out of freaking players over and inserting strange over the top rules. He would explain the fact that gods exist and could just smite us if we did something wrong or that the wizards in this city are so high and low we can't even fight them. With a weird matter of factness, like he wanted to come across his experience or get shocked reaction from players new to the game. I don't think it's uncommon for DMs to get satisfaction out of their games being unforgiving, but this guy went a level beyond that. He got satisfaction out of having people in the palm of his hand. Not only in D&D, but in general too. He's the kind of guy who tells outrageous lies to get reactions out of people, or make them think he's a big deal. The experience turned me off to TTRPGs for a while after that. Later, I would join a campaign with friends that were actually fun and I realized just how awful the experience was in comparison. God, I love when one of your first experiences with D&D is a DM having a pet player and screwing everyone else over. Sorry as all of time. Quote from a comment. Yeah. So this CM is objectively bad. Like, I don't know what it is, but it seems like some DMs just get like super into like being unforgiving and cruel to their players and I just don't know if I could ever do that as a DM. But another problem is that Patrick kind of um let one player become god and then decide to not let any other players have fun. I don't know what system you might be planning to play, but if you are going to DM or play in a system, rule number one is make sure everyone has fun. Because that is the only rule of D&D. Other than the rule that the DM is basically God or whatever, but the only real rule of D&D is just have fun. Make sure everyone is having fun together. You're, if you're not having fun, speak up. Tell your DM. Tell the other players. That's what I usually like to do. I like to have fun in my D&D games. Anyway, if you like this video, please like on the video, comment down below, and subscribe to the channel. I have no idea what I'm, what I'm going to be doing tomorrow, so until then... Goodbye.